if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley, I said impressively, suffering stranger, proceed at your peril. You see in me the melancholy wreck of a once stalwart and magnificent manhood. What has brought me to this? That thing which you are about to tell. Gradually but surely, that tiresome old anecdote has sapped my strength, undermined my constitution, withered my life. Pity my helplessness. Spare me only just this once, and tell me about young George Washington and his little hatchet for a change. We were saved, but not so the invalid. In trying, to in trying to retain the anecdote in his system, he strained himself and died in our arms. I am aware now that I ought not to have asked of the sturdiest citizen of all that region what I asked of the mere shadow of a man, for after seven years' residence on the Pacific coast, I know that no passenger or driver in the overland ever corked that anecdote in. When a stranger was by and survived, Within a period of six years, I crossed and recrossed the Sierra between Nevada and California 13 times by stage and listened to that deathless incident 481 or 82 times. I have the list somewhere. Drivers always told it. Conductors told it. Landlords told it. Chance passengers told it. The very Chinamen and vagrant Indians recounted it. I have had the same driver tell it to me two or three times in the same afternoon. It has come to me in all the multitude of tongues that babbled the grief to earth, and flavored with whiskey, brandy, beer, cologne, sazodont, tobacco, garlic, onions, grasshoppers, everything that has a fragrance to it, through all the long lists of things that are gorged or guzzled by the sons of men. I never have smelt any anecdote as often as I have smelt that one. I never have smelt any anecdote that smelt so variegated as that one. And you never could learn to know it by its smell, because every time you thought you had learned the smell of it, it would turn up with a different smell. Bayard Taylor has written about this hoary anecdote. Richardson has published it. So have Jones, Smith, Johnson, Ross Brown, and every other correspondence in indicting being that ever set his foot upon the great overland road, anywhere between Julesburg and San Francisco. And I've heard that it is in the Talmud. I have seen it in print in nine different foreign languages. I have been told that it is employed in the Inquisition in Rome. And I now learn with regret that it is going to be set to music. I do not think that such things are right. Stage coaching on the overland is no more, and stage dri drivers are a race defunct. I wonder if they bequeath the ba that bald-headed anecdote to their successors the railroad brakemen and conductors, and if these latter still persecute the helpless passenger with it until he concludes, as did many a tourist of other days, that the real grandeurs of the Pacific Coast are not Yosemite and the big trees, but Hank Monk and his adventure with Horace Greeley. And what makes that worn anecdote the more aggravating is that the adventure it celebrates never occurred. If it were a good anecdote, that seeming demerit would be its chiefest virtue, for creative power belongs to greatness. But what ought to be done to a man who would wantonly contrive so flat a one as this? If I were to suggest what ought to be done to him, I should be called extravagant. But what does the 13th chapter of Daniel say? Aha! Chapter 21. Alkali Dust. Desolation and Contemplation. Carson City. Our journey ended. We are introduced to several citizens. A strange rebook. Rebook. A washu zephyr at play. It's office hours. Governor's palace. Government offices. Our French landlady, Bridget O'Flanagan. Shadow secrets. Cause for a disturbance at once. The Irish brigade. Mrs. O'Flanagan's Borders, The Surveying Expedition, Escape of the Tarantulas. We were approaching the end of our long journey. It was the morning of the 20th day. At noon, we would reach Carson City, the capital of Nevada Territory. 
We were not glad, but sorry. It had been a fine pleasure trip. We had fed fat on wonders every day. We were now well accustomed to stage life and very fond of it. So the idea of coming to a standstill and settling down to a humdrum existence in a village was not agreeable, but on the contrary, depressing. Visibly, our new home was a desert, walled in by barren, snow-cloud mountains. There was not a tree in sight. There was no vegetation but the endless sagebrush and greasewood. All nature was gray with it. We were plowing through great deeps of powdery alkali dust that rose in thick clouds and floated across the plain like smoke from a burning house. We were coated with it like millers. So were the coach, the mules, the mailbags, the driver. We and the sagebrush and the other scenery were all one monotonous color. Long trains of freight wagons in the distance, enveloped in ascending masses of dust, suggested pictures of prairies on fire. These teams and their masters were the only life we saw. Otherwise, we moved in the midst of solitude, silence, and desolation. Every 20 steps, we passed the skeleton of some dead beast of, bur bur of burthen. <laughs> That's what it says in the text. With its dust-coated skin stretched tightly over its empty ribs, frequently a solemn raven sat upon the skull or the hips and contemplated the passing coach with meditative serenity. By and by, Carson City was pointed out to us. It nestled in the edge of a great plain and was a sufficient number of miles away to look like an assemblage of mere white spots in the shadow of a grim range of mountains overlooking it whose summits seemed lifted clear out of companionship and consciousness of earthly things. We arrived, disembarked, and the stage went on. It was a wooden town, its population 2,000 souls. The main street consisted of four or five blocks of little white frame stores, which were too high to sit down on, but not too high for various other purposes. In fact, hardly high enough. They were packed close together, side by side, as if room were scarce in that mighty plain. The sidewalk was of boards that were more or less loose and inclined to rattle when walked upon. In the middle of the town, opposite the stores, was the plaza, which is native to all towns beyond the Rocky Mountains, a large, unfenced, level vacancy with a liberty pole in it, and very useful as a place for public auctions, horse trades, and mass meetings and likewise for Teamsters to camp in. Two other sides of the plaza were faced by stores, offices, and stables. The rest of Carson City was pretty scattering. We were introduced to several citizens at the stage office and on the way up to the governors from the hotel, among others, to a Mr. Harris who was on horseback. He began to say something but interrupted himself with the remark, I'll have to get you to excuse me a minute. Yonder is the witness that swore I helped to rob the California coach. A piece of impertinent intermeddling, sir, for I am not even acquainted with the man. Then he rode over and began to rebuck the stranger with a six-shooter, and the stranger began to explain with another. When the pistols were emptied, the stranger resumed his work, mending a whiplash. And Mr. Harris rode by with a polite nod, homeward bound with a bullet through one of his lungs and several in his hips and from them issued little rivulets of blood that coursed down the horse's sides and made the animal look quite picturesque. I never saw Harris shoot a man after that but it recalled to mind that first day in Carson. This is all we saw that day for it was two o'clock now and according to custom the daily Washu Zephyr set in. A soaring dust drift about the size of the United States set up edgewise came with it, and the capital of Nevada Territory disappeared from view. Still, there were sights to be seen which were not wholly uninteresting to newcomers, for the vast dust cloud was thickly freckled with things strange to the upper air, things living and dead, that flitted hither and thither, going and coming, appearing and disappearing among the rolling billows of dust, hats, chickens, and parasols sailing in the remote heavens, blankets, tin signs, sagebrush, and shingles a shade lower, doormats and buffalo robes lower still, shovels and coal scuttles on the next grade, glass doors, cats, and little children on the next, 
disrupted lumber yards, light buggies, and wheelbarrows on the next, and down only 30 or 40 feet above ground was a scurrying storm of immigrating roofs and vacant lots. It was something to see that much. I could have seen more if I could have kept the dust out of my eyes. But seriously, a washu wind is by no means a trifling matter. It blows flimsy houses down, lifts shingle roofs occasionally, rolls up tin ones like sheet music now and then, uh, now and then blows a stagecoach over and spills the passengers. And tradition says the reason there are so many bald people there, there is that the wind blows the hair off their heads while they are looking skyward after their hats. Carson streets seldom look inactive on summer afternoons because there are so many citizens skipping around their escaping hats like chambermaids trying to head off a spider. The Washu Zephyr, Washu is a pet nickname for Nevada, is, peculiar, is a peculiarly scriptural wind in that no man knoweth whence it cometh. That is to say, where it originates. It comes right over the mountains from the west, but when, when, but when one crosses the ridge, he does not find any of it on the other side. It probably is manufactured on the mountaintop for the occasion, and starts from there. It is a pretty regular wind in the summertime. Its office hours are from two in the afternoon till two the next morning, and anybody venturing abroad during those twelve hours needs to allow for the wind, or he will bring up a mile or two to leeward of the point he is aiming at. And yet the first complaint a Washu visitor to San Francisco makes is that the sea winds blow so there. There is a good deal of human nature in that. We found the state palace of the governor of Nevada territory to consist of a white frame one-story house with two small rooms in it and a stanchion supported shed in front for grandeur. It compelled the respect of the citizen and inspired the Indians with awe. The newly arrived chief and associate justices of the territory and other machinery of government were domiciled with less splendor. They were boarding around, uh, around privately and had their offices in their bedrooms. The secretary and I took quarters in the ranch of a worthy French lady by the name of Bridget O'Flanagan, a camp follower of His Excellency the Governor. She had known him in his prosperity as Commander-in-Chief of the Metropolitan Police of New York, and she would not desert him in his adversity as Governor of Nevada. Our room was on the lower floor facing the plaza, and when we had got our bed, a small table, two chairs, the government fireproof safe, and the unabridged dictionary into it, there was still room enough for, left for a visitor, maybe two, but not without straining the walls. But the walls could stand it, at least the partitions could, for they consisted simply of one thickness of white cotton domestic stretched from corner to corner of the room. That this was the rule in Carson. Any other kind of partition was the rare exception. And if you stood in a dark room and your neighbors in the next had lights, the shadows on your canvas told queer secrets sometimes. Very often these partitions were made of old flour sacks basted together. And then the difference between the common herd and the aristocrat...